Hi, welcome to LPC Online. I'm Pastor Doug and I wanna thank you for joining us today, especially those who are watching for the first time. If you'd like to connect with us, you can go to our website, listdualpc.com and leave us a message. We really hope that God uses this time to help you grow in your faith and be encouraged. Well, what a year it's been. We're excited to lead some worship with you today. And I want to start by reading a passage from Romans. Romans 8, verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You were the word at the beginning One with God, the Lord Most High Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you our Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus you didn't want heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is! Nothing can Jesus. 
familiar hymn, Be Thou My Vision. And um, I added a chorus inspired from these words from John. John 17. I can just flip to it here. (laughs) This way. (laughs) Fast forward video here. (laughs) Non-electronic Bible. John 17. Some snippets from John 17. I'll start at verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, that so that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 23. I in them, and you in me that they may be perfected in unity. We pray that God will open our eyes to see his presence in our everyday lives and in these moments that are difficult in this year, but that God would open our eyes to see and find freedom in him. Bye. 
Our world and our culture are obsessed with life planning. No matter what, if you have checked out a, a leadership development or a personal development guru, a podcast, a book, everyone will say the exact same thing. You need to set goals. You need to create strategies, great, create timelines so that you have structure and a system in place for your life. That will give you the ability to be successful you will be more productive, you will have more things come into your life and you will be able to accomplish more than you ever thought possible. Now, how many of you can relate to this and say, yes, I have my life all figured out. I have it mapped out, I have it planned out. I know what I want to do, I know who I want to be, and I know how I'm gonna accomplish it. I have a three-year goal, a five-year goal, a seven-year goal, a 10-year goal, I have everything figured out, even to the point of my retirement and after retirement. I already know the hobbies I'm going to do, the traveling I'm going to do, where I'm going to go. I have everything mapped out. Now that's clearly one group. And the ones who are normally type A's and who are very driven and motivated and probably very entrepreneurial, that is a group of people that many of us look at and say, I wish I could be like that. Now, there's another group, of course, and usually whenever this is brought up, there's, they're separated into two distinct groups, those who have all the answers and those who have all the question marks. The people who don't have a clue what they're going to do with their life, who they want to be, what they're feeling called to, how they're going to accomplish it, where they should even go to figure it out. They don't even have a clue of what job they need, what school they need to go to if they're gonna get married, if they're gonna have a family, everything is just question mark after question mark. And it just seems like this big unknown. Now for some people that is very, I would say worrisome or anxiety inducing. That is crazy to think about all of those unknowns and walk into that fully aware. There are other people that look at that and say, oh my goodness, the spontaneity, the excitement, the adventure to the unknown, that is something that I am drawn to. So there are definitely two personalities and two types of people there. But there are these two groups and it's normally traditionally broken down into these two types of groups, these two types of people, those who have life plans and have goals and have everything figured out and those who don't. But I think if we are actually being honest with ourselves, and I think if we would be truly fair and authentic, we would say, you know what, in my experience and in my life so far, even the young people could say this, I have had ideas, I've had dreams, I've had goals, I've had things mapped out, and I have encountered curveballs, detours, changes, closed doors, and rejection, or new opportunities coming. It has not gone the way I've planned. And I think most of us, if we're honest, would say that is true for them too. Life has come with many unknown surprises, unexpected surprises, and things that have taken our best laid plans and turned them on their head. And that seems to be the way life goes. That seems to be what happens to most of us, if not all of us, in some capacity. Life throws us a curve ball. Now, many of us will look at that and say, and yeah, that's just a universal, normal experience. That's the way life works, or the universe, or some other element. That is the way it just happens, whether it's fate or not. But I think if we're honest, looking at it through our scope, understanding God and how he works, I would actually suggest that a lot of those new opportunities Closed doors, detours, and changes are actually God at work in our situation. It's really God taking his will and bringing it into our life and taking our best laid ideas and plans and pushing them to the side so that his will can become sovereign. I think that a lot of this is the Holy Spirit. When we think we have everything figured out, when we have our mind fixated on our agendas and our goals, the Holy Spirit comes along and says, let's close that door. Let's block that path quickly so that it brings you back to me, coming to me again for my direction and my ability to bring discernment and give you the next step. And I think that that's often how the Holy Spirit works. Not when we are just off on our own, going on our own path, being rebellious, but even when we're doing things right. And I think that it's vital for us to be able to recognize that some closed doors in our lives, if not most of the closed doors in our life, are actually divine closed doors. 
So my question to you before we get into the message is, are you encountering divinely closed doors today? Are you experiencing something in your life right now where the Holy Spirit is blocking you off from what you thought was your path to bring you back to God's path? And so now what I want to do is bring the reading to you. And it's an exciting reading that, again, seems very administrative and mundane, but has great spiritual truth all the way through it. We're going to be looking at Acts 16, starting at verse 4. And I think it's incredible to see how Paul and Silas and their team encounter God's direction. So starting with verse 4. Then they went from town to town, instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. This is following that Jerusalem council. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. Next, Paul and Silas traveled around the area of Phygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at the time. Then coming to the border of Mysia, they headed north to the province of Bithynia. But again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision, a man from Macedonia in the northern Greece, standing there and pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. We boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Semathras. And the next day we landed in Nepolis, From there, we reached Philippi, a major city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we stayed there for several days. This is our passage for today. And it is a wonderful and it's a very interesting passage. But a passage that I believe has great spiritual truth and applicability for us and for our lives today. Let's ask for God's word and for his help so that we can recognize his revelation and receive it today so we can have a better idea of what it means to live following that path that God laid out for us and recognize the Holy Spirit when he's closing those doors. So join with me as we pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that you have given us this word. Thank you for instructing Luke to record even these small, simple, administrative things that don't really seem to contain a lot of deep spiritual truth, but when we're really open to it, God can give us a better understanding of who you are and how you operate. Give us the ability to recognize how the Holy Spirit's moving in the lives of Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke and the rest of their team, and what it would look like for us today, what it might be happening in our lives right now. Give us the ability to recognize the Spirit moving and learn what it means for us. We ask and we pray for your help with this and for your will for the rest of the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are different themes that show up in this passage. Like I said, there are different elements and places and geographic locations and even types of of callings. The theme that I want to focus on specifically today is the influence and the authority of the Holy Spirit and how he's moving in a way that seems very strong, but also at times very difficult. And it seems like he's coming in in a very strong manner and closing doors over and over for Paul and his team. Even doors that seem to be good things, great things, but they aren't God's will. And so what I want to start off with is is really going going back to the very beginning, which is verses 4 and 5, where we're starting off with the context of where this is coming from. Now, Paul, Silas, and eventually Timothy are joining. They are in a place where they're having an incredible and highly successful ministry on the island of Syria. So Syria is doing some great things. They're having some great success there, which is encouraging. We're getting to see how Paul is going from town to town over and over again. And he is meeting more and more believers. He's teaching, he's instructing to them. And as he's doing that, God is continuing to move. The Holy Spirit is bringing great favor. He is touching people's hearts. He's encouraging believers over and over again. And actually what is happening is he is able to minister in such a powerful way that the faith of all of the believers in each and every one of these towns continues to grow and develop and their numbers expand daily. These 
churches, these communities that are established of believers, are growing both in their faith and in their numbers, and they're doing it in huge capacity. Every single town where Paul and Silas and his team are going, they're having such success that people in the next town are hearing about it. Believers are traveling around. Word is spreading. And as Paul keeps doing his rounds over and over again, he's seeing these churches that he's planting grow more and more and more. This is in every way an incredible success. A great opportunity for God to move. And he's doing incredible things with this land of Syria, with the people of Syria. And Paul is able to invest highly in these believers. And every time he does another round, he's able to recognize more and more how these churches are growing and incredible things are happening. And Luke, even when he's recording this, is showing how every single day there are miracles happening Every single day, people are becoming more encouraged, more strong in their faith, and more people from the community are joining these believers. And this is something that I believe would be, again, a quick mountaintop, incredible moment, where I think at this point, Paul is fully aware that the Holy Spirit is working through him. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are seeing incredible things. Luke is recording these incredible things. And through all of it, we're able to recognize that God is sovereign and he is at work. And then, in the midst of this incredible, wonderful moment, this mountaintop experience, Paul, Silas, and his team encounter a huge barrier, a door being slammed in their face. And it's weird because that door being slammed in the face is literally identified as coming from the Holy Spirit. Let's look at verses 6 to 8 again, where it's made very plain by Luke what is going on. It says, Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of, of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at the time. This is very interesting. Paul clearly had an agenda. He clearly had a desire. He wanted to go next to Asia to bring his his ministry, to bring the gospel, to bring God's word to these people. He had a burden and a passion for this community. Now, the Asia that's being referenced here is different than the Asia that we understand. This would have been a part of modern-day Turkey, not actually the continent that we most commonly identify as Asia, because it would have been what's called Asia Minor. Now, that was something very interesting, because Paul was starting to head out to that area, because he's already in Galatia, in Prysia, or Prysia. So these are two areas where they are identified as being within that area of modern-day Turkey. And every time Paul wanted to get to this place where he felt called and he felt motivated and was burdened to meet these people, he had the Holy Spirit slam the door in his face. Now, we don't know what that looked like. We don't know what it could have been. It could have been the fact that there was suddenly some form of conflict that was blocking that town from him, some form of Roman presence that was blocking from going, a travel ban of some kind, or a a burden within his spirit where he felt like he couldn't go there. All we know is that it says the Holy Spirit had prevented them from going, had stopped them from being able to travel there. Whether it's even their travel plans falling apart. Again, Luke doesn't identify what the Holy Spirit did. But he is very, very clear that this was the Holy Spirit at work. And so because of that, they decided to come a different way. This is funny because we get to see Paul, who is the Apostle Paul, Silas and Timothy, great incredible heroes within the early church, having God stop them from going into a place blocking them, closing a door, and then they try to open up a window so they can still be able to get through and get into that room that they want to go into. So they start to come up through the border of Mysia, heading north for the province of Bithynia, trying to again get into a place to access Asia Minor. But it says again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. Now, the Spirit of Jesus doesn't mean that God sent Jesus as well to help the Holy Spirit. It literally means that they're referring to Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus, as the Holy Spirit. And the reason why is because 
Jesus was the one that said, I'm sending another one like me to come to you. I am sending another one who is just like me, who will be your helper. So they identify him in the here as the spirit of Jesus. It's also identifying the fact that the Trinity is interconnected. And so this is a moment where it's not a separate spirit, a different one. There's the Holy Spirit and the spirit of Jesus. No, it's the same Holy Spirit at work. He's just being referred to by a different name, the spirit of Jesus. Because it says, again, again, the spirit, the spirit being capitalized, identifying it as a personality. The spirit said, no, 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 no. You are not allowed to go in there, even though what you're doing is a good thing. Yes, you want to go to these group of people and bring them the gospel. But what the Spirit is trying to identify here is you are not doing things according to God's will. It's still a good thing, but it's not a God thing. And so the Spirit stops Paul from going in, blocks him and closes the door. He tries to go in through the window, closes that window and slams it shut and says, you are not going to Asia Minor right now. Doesn't mean Paul doesn't get to go later, but God had a different plan. In fact, God had a better plan. And in his sovereign grace and mercy, in his sovereignty, he said, listen, you need to stop trying to do that now and hear what I am telling you to do. I am bringing you this closed door now to get you back onto my path, back onto the right path, so that you can be where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to do. And I think that it's incredible to see how even Paul, even the apostle, even a person who was clearly being used by God in a powerful way, didn't have all the answers, didn't have everything figured out, didn't know what God was calling him to do next. He didn't have the full picture. And it took him finally coming to a place where he has this vision. He has this vision, and this vision is able to give him a better understanding of what's going on. Now, the vision, we believe, is also divinely inspired. It was sent by God, and it was of a Macedonian man, which is up in the northern Greece area, saying, you need to come to us. We need you to come to us and bring us the good news of the gospel. So, The Holy Spirit came by blocking him, by closing doors, closing the window, stopping him again and again from going over. But it was really a good thing. It was a God thing. Even though Paul is clearly frustrated by it, so much so that when that door closes, Paul continues to try to get his desires and his will. He keeps trying to find another way to get into where he's going because he wants to accomplish something. And it took Paul having two doors closed, two divine rejections for him to finally get that God had something different. And then, as he's in a place of saying, okay, God, what am I supposed to do? What are you calling us to do? That's when God sends him the vision. Then he provides him the next step. He doesn't give him the whole idea. God could have easily said, okay, here's the whole timetable, the whole strategy for your life as a missionary. What you're going to do, where you're going to go, when you're going to do it, what's going to happen to you. He could have gave him everything. But instead, the Holy Spirit gives him the next step, just the next step, and gives him a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come to Macedonia, come and help us. Bring the gospel, the good news to us because we are waiting on it. And instantly it says something funny. Then Luke records, we decided. So Paul shared this with everyone else. Even though Paul is the only one identified as having the vision, he shares it with all the other people and they decide, oh, you know what? This is clearly a God thing now. Now we know why all the doors were closed. Now we know why the Holy Spirit has blocked us from moving any further and brought this detour into our path. Let's go to Macedonia. Clearly, that's where God is calling us. And instead of just saying it in lip service, even though they could have continued to try to get into Asia Minor, they could have continued to say, okay, God, clearly you're wanting us to go this way, but we still want to go this way. We've only tried three times, so let's try again. Why not? Let's keep going. But in this case, we find out that they obey. Once they recognized where the Holy Spirit was leading them, once they received the truth and recognized in their hearts that it was the Holy Spirit calling them, they boarded a boat at Troas, sailed straight across the island of Samothrace, and the next day they landed in Neapolis. From there, they were reaching Philippi, 
a major city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, and they stayed there for several days. They responded with obedience once they knew where God was calling them. But it took God closing those doors, just blocking their path, stopping and throwing out their whole plans in order for them to recognize that God had a whole different agenda. God had a different timeline. God had a different will than their own. And it took them having those closed doors, those doors slammed in their face over and over again for them to finally put aside their ideas, their own desires, and turn to God and say, okay, what are we supposed to do? Where are you calling us to go? What is your will? And so I think what we can draw from this, there's a ton of different lessons that we can draw from this, but the biggest one that I want to draw your attention to is this. When you face closed doors, when you encounter doors slammed in your face, how often are those God? What if the Holy Spirit is truly trying to say something to you? He's trying to get your attention because you have your own plans. You have your own desires, your own agenda, your life figured out. And God's like, well, that's fantastic, but that's not my desire for you. That's not my will for your life. I have a plan for you. And it's not just great, it's the best plan. If you are willing to listen, in order to get our attention, God often does the one thing that we need to have because otherwise we will just keep skipping along according to our idea, our strategy. He'll have a closed door. He'll have some form of a barrier, a challenge, something to block your path and mess up everything. But that is the Holy Spirit bringing you a gift, even though it doesn't feel like it at the moment, to show us what God's, do, God's will is, his desire, and his better plan. And then we have the opportunity to be like Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke. We have the ability to say, okay, God, now that we've had this door slammed on our face twice, what are you wanting to tell us? What are we supposed to do? Because our desires and our agendas have fallen apart. So what is your desire and your agenda? What are you calling us to do now? And maybe like Paul and Silas, he'll give us just the next step. He'll give us just enough that we need to know what comes next, but not the whole idea. But if we're willing to truly walk in faith and by faith, this is how God is calling us to live being led by the Holy Spirit, who is really our divine compass. He's the one who's supposed to direct us every step of the, path, every step of the way, the whole path. But we get so caught up in our desires and our plans that we stop listening to God. We stop looking at that compass for direction. So when you're encountering those closed doors, I would encourage you to pray and ask God, What is going on in my life? What are you trying to tell me? And what is your direction for my life now? Give me the next step so I can make sure that I'm on your path, not my path. Let's say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the fact that you are with us and you are completely sovereign. You are completely good in everything that we encounter, everything that we experience in our life, you are present and you are with us for provision. You know exactly what we need each and every moment of our day. So God, may we continue to rely on you for all of the things that we are going through. Our life and our goals, our dreams, may we turn to you, God, and submit them to you and say, Father, what is your will for our life? May we submit to your plan and your agenda and say, God, use us as you see fit, when you see fit, where you see fit, and that we would have the capacity to trust that your Holy Spirit is our guide. And whenever we get off path, if he wants to bring those closed doors and slam those doors in our faces, may we have the ability to recall and remember again that we're supposed to be following a guide, not blazing our own trail. We ask and we pray, God, that you would continue to remind us of that and help us to truly walk the path that you've laid out for us so that we can accomplish your will, your kingdom work, and make an even greater lasting impact on our world. We ask and we pray for this today. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for watching, for engaging with us. And I pray this word is something that challenges you today, but also brings you encouragement. Because every closed door and blocked path that you encounter, every detour that you encounter in your life, is really an opportunity for us to turn to God and say, okay, what do you have next? And with that, we have the ability to be in his will and accomplishing bigger things than us. My benediction for us is uh, actually from, uh, it's a blog that I've been checking out every now and again called Tea and Theology. It's kind of fun. It's very light, but it says something really, really incredible for this special Pentecost benediction. Because today is the day of Pentecost. And it says, may we go out into the world filled with the spark of the Holy Spirit, letting his love guide our actions. And Father, remind us and help us to listen for your spirit of truth and for his guidance as we spread the peace of Christ in every moment of our lives. We ask and we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for engaging. I pray you have a blessed week. Take care.